Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Malaika Zedi. I am a senior studying history and science at the college. Um, and I am one of the co-chairs of the Politics of Race and Ethnicity program at the Institute of Politics. I am also one of the co-presidents of the Harvard College Pakistani Students Association. Last year, around this time, we fundraised over $30,000 to support the flood relief efforts in Pakistan and on behalf of the Pakistani community at Harvard. We are also excited to mem uh, welcome the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hina Rabbani Kar, to the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School. Um, before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side um, and the JFK street side. Um, and in the event of an emergency, please walk to the emergency exit and congregate in the JFK park. Um, please do take a moment now to silent your cell phones um, and give a warm welcome to Emil Massad. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name's Emil. Uh, I'm a junior in Quincy. I'm studying environmental science and public policy. Uh, I'm a co-president of, co of the Harvard Undergraduate Clean Energy Group, and I'm today here on behalf of the IOP to uh, introduce today's forum. So what, it, what is climate overshoot? Um, in 2015, the Paris Climate Agreement produced an aspirational goal of limiting global uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, to, or global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. According to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, that means that global greenhouse gas emissions must peak before 2025 and decline by 43% by 2030. If that indicator is, ex is exceeded, even temporarily, uh, the intense environmental and societal consequences will be felt across the globe and the risk of cascading uh, and irreversible climate impacts becomes increasingly likely. And so as 1.5 degrees draws closer, the question remains, how can we best reduce the risk and uncertainty that comes with climate overshoot? And that question is what the Overshoot Commission uh, a group of former heads of government, leaders of environmental organizations, and academic experts has set out to define in their most recent report, reducing the risks of climate overshoot. In their words, quote, every extra tenth of a degree and every extra decade of overshoot matter. This makes it all the more important to strive to reduce risks under all possible future conditions. And so with us today are two members of that commission. Francis Beinecke is a president emerita of the National Resor Natural Resources Defense Council, currently serves on the board of multiple environmental organizations across the US and abroad, including the World Resources Institute. And Hino Rabbani Kar is a former, minister, foreign, former foreign minister of Pakistan and has led a distinctive career across many sectors of government and international policy. Finally, moderating the panel is Joseph Aldi, a professor of the practice of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Please join me in welcoming today's panel. Thank you, Emil. Welcome, Hina. Welcome, Francis. Nice to be here. Welcome to everyone here. About 60 years ago, the President of the United States received a report about the state of the environment. It was the first time that a US president had been informed of this thing called climatic change. Since then, we've used a number of terms, global warming, climate change, climate emergency. I have a few scientist friends who endeavor to be communication specialists and say global weirding. It didn't really catch on. But as we think about the climate crisis, we now have a new term that has come to the fore when we think about the climate overshoot. So as we have here two commissioners from the Climate Overshoot Commission, I first want to hear from each of you, we'll go in, in, in turn, about what the climate overshoot means to you. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the term? Mm -hmm. and what does that mean about how we try to tackle this problem? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, first of all, pleasure to be here. Um, and, uh, and pleasure to be speaking to a group which I think is most affected by what climate overshoot could mean, right? Climate overshoot is simply uh, not being able to remain within the limits of this being a habitable planet, okay? And uh, the reality of this is that 
if we had done what we all know, which is logic, raw logic, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, you don't need to be an expert, raw logic that we needed to mitigate, we needed to bring down the emissions. Had we brought down the emissions 10 years from today, five years from today, even two years from today, we would not need to adapt, we would not need resilience and money to be spent on it, and we would certainly not need removal techniques, and certainly not the more controversial techniques to bring the temperature down. So overshoot is simply about being in a space where you and I cannot exist normally. And increasingly in the last one year, I think this is just one last year. You know, interestingly, so I've been in the public space for a very long time. And initially, when I was in the development public space, every time somebody would talk to me about climate change, I used to think this is something that I owe to the future generations. And this is something that I'm doing for my children. You know what? The floods of 2022, the floods in Syria, uh, what happened in Greece, what happened in Hong Kong, the fact that we have recorded three highest temperature in human man, you know, human history in this one last year, tells you you're doing no favors to anyone else. You're ensuring that the earth can remain habitable for us. Francis. Well, just to echo, first of all, wonderful to be here and to echo, uh, you know, this is a question of, um, can we keep the Earth's atmosphere within the framework of uh, having it be habitable for the human race? And not that the planet won't go on, not that uh, there won't be natural systems, but can humans survive it? And I think we did start the commission uh, in the middle of the Pakistani floods, and Hina was very outspoken about what the human consequences of that is. Uh, we issued our report last week when Libya was inundated. and. Every month this year um, have been extreme events all around the world where we have seen what the impacts are. So overshoot is, are we going to go past 1.5 degrees? And the risk of that is very, very high. But it's not a number. It is really what the condition of livability is across the planet, what the human consequences are, and what are the uh, means available to minimize those risks and alleviate the consequences that we are seeing every day. And I think that um, you and I, Joe, were talking earlier when, you know, also when we started on this, and I've worked on this for 40 years, we thought it was a future problem. It's a now problem. It's today's problem. Uh, you know, when we look back at the way we were talking about it, future generations is not the way to talk about it. It is our generation, your generation, and what we need, uh, how do we create the political will worldwide, country by country, to take the actions that are necessary. This is not, you can't pass the buck on this. This isn't somebody else's problem. We all share the problem to different degrees in different countries. And I'm hoping that what this report does is identify different strategies, different opportunities that individual countries will take up and adopt. And through that, through learning, each and every one, sharing what are the things that work? How do we accelerate those? How do we take them to scale? How do we get the money for it? And you know, we'll see if it's possible. I mean, we certainly uh, know what needs to be done. The question is if we have the political will and we have the means to do it. Right, so I want to follow up on something that Hannah brought up, which is the, the agenda that you've laid out in your recommendations. Mm -hmm. That when we think sort of in contrast to kind of the history of climate policy, 31 years ago in Rio de Janeiro, the Earth Summit, the discussion on climate was all about cutting emissions. Mm -hmm. The window for addressing this problem adequately, mm -hmm. simply by cutting emissions, is probably passed mm -hmm. us by. And so now the commission has looked at this much broader agenda, the, the care agenda, mm -hmm. Hannah, that you referenced, yep. about cutting emissions for the mm -hmm. sea, a is the adaptation, R is removing CO2, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, E is this exploration, and we're gonna spend some time exploring what E means on exploration yeah. on uh, new um, uh, technologies that will give people some pause, and we're gonna to get to that. That's gonna be my little teaser. But first I wanna talk about cutting emissions. So we've been talking about cutting emissions for a long time. We used to talk about wanting to cut emissions globally 80% by 2050. When I was in the government, that was kind of the goal for developed countries. 
More recently, starting in the, you know, about three, four years ago, the European Commission said, we're going to go to net zero by 2050. And then we had a lot of other countries come forward, including now under the Biden administration, the United States saying that. You now call for, we need the developed countries, the rich countries to be net negative by 2050. So how do we get the political will to make that happen? Well, I think that um, clearly outrage and um, action are important. I mean, what is driving uh, attention are literally millions of young people around the planet demanding action. And you know, just two days ago in New York, there were 75,000 people marching on behalf of climate. And I think, you know, one is to know what the policy solutions are. Two is creating the political will driving ambition and demanding accountability of world leaders. And I think you know, th that's growing. It's growing well beyond the environmental community. And I think that has to grow, 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 create more strength, more weight. And as the impacts get felt literally everywhere, that voice is growing. And I think that's what's going to drive political will. Right. So uh, Hannah, in the report, there is discussion about sort of differences in timing and ambition mm -hmm. among countries. There has long been this tension among countries engaged in climate policy debates about the concern in the global south on the need for economic development mm -hmm. to raise standards of living uh, and the view that this problem has largely, largely been caused by the developed world. Sure. Um, if we think about just the math, as you were talking about earlier, we know emissions need to decline mm -hmm. in developing countries as well. How do you think about the strategy for getting political support mm -hmm. for an agenda that can cut emissions and still raise living standards in developing countries? OK, so Joe, I'm going to be a little bit less diplomatic about answering Please. this and the first question that you posed to uh, Francis also, because I think you know, the question, how do we get the political will? You know what? It is not there. Okay? And that's why we are in the stage two, three, and four. And that's why we are in the stage where we're burning ourselves to death and we were sleepwalking into disaster after disaster, unable to wake ourselves up to what is facing us. Because it's all a bad matter of and a battle for who will do it first. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, the, the, the whole sense of responsibility. So it's not nobody's asking you to give uh, something as charity or as arms to another. It's about taking responsibility for the irresponsible development that you did on the basis of which the entire planet is suffering. So for instance, I'll give you the case of Pakistan. Pakistan is asking for no arms. Pakistan is asking for no contributions. Pakistan is only saying that as a country which is less than 1% contributor to the emissions, but happens to be one of the 10 most vulnerable countries to the threat of climate change in all its various forms and you know, manifestations, uh, the world owes it to us and other countries like ours to take its responsibility for irresponsible development, right? Therefore, the commission, I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to agree on differentiated responsibility. Mm -hmm. Equal, but differentiated responsibility. So if I have contributed, you know, it's, 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 it's like if, if I am, if I've torched a campsite, I need to clean up, right? Rather than say, now you cannot even do normal development over there. And the developing world, by the way, I think is a little bit far ahead or, uh, because it is on this receiving end of the enormity of the climate challenge that it is willing to do it. Uh, it doesn't have the resources to do it. So for instance, we are not in a moment that we were 10 or 15 years back where wind energy and solar energy was also expensive and infeasible. Today, everything is feasible. All the tools are there and that's why this commission comes together. The tools are there. We just need to get our act together and start demonstrating our will to be able to solve the problem rather than keep on creating. The, 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 the path that we are currently on, we already know. You know, UNEP tells us that currently we are at a path where we are not meeting the commitments that we made and we are actually going to certainly, the, almost the certainly. The Paris commitments. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, for 2030, right. And almost certainly overshoot and we know yeah. the effect of that and we're seeing the effect of that. So, so this whole question of political will, I think uh, I'm, I'm also a little bit charged up about it because you know, as, as somebody who has represented uh, the, the, what you call the global south, which I call the developing world, uh, in various foras, unfortunately, we have allowed a thing like climate to become a north-south divide. 
Now this whole question of the loss and damage fund, it took this world 30 years, three decades, and allow me to say floods in Pakistan, which affected 33 million people, to get to agree to the setup of the lost and damaged fund, right? Let alone the finances which are going to come. And then the transparency of the finances. So when you say we commit $100 billion to climate change, well, most of that money is reoriented from development window into this, into that, and all of this is very messy, and we allow it to be messy. We allow it to be trans intransparent. So we are allowing a lot of wrong right in plain sight, and nobody's, nobody's allowed to call it. Okay, and we will keep on doing more and more mega events, make them more and more inclusive. We are happy to have fancy events, very, uh, and you know, very un, sort of um, caring about what are we achieving to the commitments that we have made in the previous fancy event, okay? So, you mentioned the 100 billion. This was a commitment first made in international negotiations mm. back in 2009 uh, for developed countries yeah, to transfer funds mm. uh, to developing countries. We had an assessment in the, um, I guess it was the Glasgow COP to say mm. we didn't meet up that goal. Mm. We were supposed to ramp it up by 2020. We didn't meet that goal. So the challenge is both, do we have enough resources going, but are we smart enough in how we use our resources? And as you noted, we need to think about not just what we do to cut emissions, but we have to start getting, doing more and more in adaptation. We are living in a world that is changing because we have put too, much, too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. How can we get smarter about adaptation so that we can make some of these more vulnerable countries more resilient to the changing climate, even as we maybe make, if we are successful in delivering on some of these goals, even if we're really successful in cutting our emissions, we know we're still gonna be facing adverse climate change impacts for decades to come. How do we get smarter about adaptation? That's and smarter about how we transfer resources in order in various ways to enable greater resilience? Stop trying to do someone else's job is a simple answer to that, right? Stop trying international efforts to do local stuff. Adaptation requires adaptation to the local environment and climatic conditions and local topography and local realities and local development that can only be decided by the country and the people of the village or of the city or of the country. So when we try and do go local by being international, we actually waste, do a lot of waste, but we're happy to do it because it appeases our conscience, right? So I think adaptation needs to be married in ever so deeply at the seedling level or perhaps at the sowing of the seed level with development goals. And this is something that we talk, to, talk about in our report also, in, in the report. Because you see, adaptation, so they can't be, okay, I'm making a canal, now this is a canal I've built, now I'm going to make an adaptation canal. <laughs> when I'm making the canal, I need to make sure that adaptation is built into how I design that canal. Now, will we have experts from, you know, the other part of the world coming in and doing it? No, absolutely not. So, I think there's a lot of uh, trust deficit um, and a lack of will in actually making it happen rather than seeming to make it happen. And uh, this is the story of development, uh, you know, finance for the last many decades. Right. And I think the same thing, the lessons learned from there are there. I mean, the lessons are there. We just need to learn and adopt them to be able to do adaptation correctly. Uh, so Francis, when we think about the sort of the third pillar here, the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, for one thing, this is necessary if we're going to see at the national level, eventually at the global level, net negative emissions. We know there's too much already up there. We know over the coming decades, even if we're ambitious and phasing out the use of fossil fuels as discussed in the report, we're still going to need to pull some of the CO2 out of, out of the atmosphere. What do you see as the options here for doing this? Where are there opportunities to really driving important change? But also, what are some of the challenges when we think about removing CO2 from the atmosphere? Well, first, from um, CO2 removal, there are two mechanisms. One's biological, one's technological. So on the biological, there are several strategies that are currently available. First, we don't want to lose ground on the resources that currently store carbon, our forests, our mangroves, our peatlands. And the countries that um, house those resources, the predominant ones, there have to be payment mechanisms. You have to pay to keep those in place. So we don't want to lose ground. Then we want to store carbon 
uh, through restoration, restoration of forests, peatlands, mangroves, and there's a lot of work being done on that. But we have to realize that natural resource carbon storage is finite. And when you look at the volume of carbon in the atmosphere that um, is projected to, you know, that we need to pull out, nature only has a piece to play, but it's available right now. So we need to maximize the investment in protecting nature, restoring nature now, and being sure that that restoration is secure enough that the carbon stores aren't re-released. And of course, nature is under threat from climate change, fires, et cetera, extreme weather events. So that's a very challenging prospect, but it's one we really need to invest in. The other part is technological removal. And there's a lot of work being done on what are the different technologies, direct air capture, BECs, other things that can pull carbon out of the atmosphere technologically. That is very expensive. And now, and the reason, in fact, um, the primary reason that we invest so heavily in the report on mitigation is that mitigation is the cheapest way currently available to reduce emissions and get us on a clean energy pathway. Carbon dioxide removal is not affordable now. The Inflation Reduction Act in the United States has incentivized it. It's possible that over time it will be available. But when you look at overshoot, overshoot is imminent. The risk is now. And carbon dioxide removal may be available commercially decades from now, You know, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now. So there's a cost factor, and there's a timeline factor, and there's a technology factor. But we need to explore it, and we need to incentivize it. It's a tremendous amount of waste that government has to take responsibility for. They have to have policies. They have to have governance. There have to be incentive mechanisms so people make the investment, both from the public sector and the private sector. So CDR is a huge body of work that needs to be done. It's in a very nascent stage. But if you, you know, read the IPCC reports and look at the carbon stocks in the atmosphere, it's like, we better hope it's real. You know, but there are consequences to it. So let's invest heavily in nature now, and let's get the technology going and evaluate whether it can be cost effective in the more middle term. So, and, the, and the report, I just have to say, it, it does promote incentivizing and exploring and trying to understand is that going to work? I would say right now, you know, there's hope that it'll work, but do we know it'll work? No, not really. So on the technological end, some have said we can use this kind of technology or similar technology with a fossil fuel power plant and put it on the smokestack or put it in the combustion process and capture the CO2 and put it in the ground. This report suggests phasing out fossil fuels. That's right. So I'm wondering if you could sort of shed some light on how you thought about let's do carbon dioxide removal, but we're not going to support the use of carbon capture technology with fossil right. energy. The pur purpose of carbon dioxide removal is to take out the huge stock of carbon that's currently in the atmosphere. We are not proposing that carbon dioxide removal is suddenly a license for the fossil fuel industry to continue burning fossil fuels and polluting the atmosphere. And we're very clear on that in the report. And in fact, one of the things we propose in the report is a carbon take back provision where the fossil fuel industry is, incre is given increased responsibility and requirement to pull carbon and store it securely. That it's, they have created this problem, they bear some responsibility, I would say a large responsibility to address it. It is not a license for them to continue to explore and develop fossil fuel resources. Let's be clear on that. So I want to turn to the fourth pillar. Uh, you recommend exploring a new technology, uh, referring to as solar radiation management. And so for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, there's a variety of different kinds of technologies, but one uh, that's been discussed is the possibility that you could fly planes into the upper atmosphere, inject small reflective particles into the atmosphere and reflect some incoming sunlight. And as a result, you'd offset some of the warming and perhaps some of the damages associated with climate change. Motivated in part by natural experiments. We've seen this from some volcanoes in the past. If you 
you know, when I was one, if you look back at the temperature record, I started working on climate change in the 1990s. We always talked about the 90s being, having like nine of the 10 warmest years on record. And the one year that it didn't, it was in part because of Mount Punatubo. Big eruption early in the decade. So there's been this discussion about how we might, if we're not doing enough to cut our emissions, the flow of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we're not doing enough to facilitate adaptation and invest in resilience, that one other option that we may uh, pursue would be to use solar geoengineering. This is controversial. This has raised uh, concerns among many in the environmental community about what might be some of the unintended consequences of the technology, what might be some of the incentive properties. You know, just as Francis noted the concerns with carbon dioxide removal, that it might to some be viewed as a means for the fossil fuel industry to continue uh, to produce goods and for it to be consumed and emit CO2, that this technology might enable continued emissions as well. So let's talk a little bit about what I think is a two-part recommendation on this in the report. So there's a moratorium recommended, mm -hmm. and there's a call for work in the interim on, permit me if you will, sort of small-scale non-field research and governance. So it'd be nice to get a little bit of a sense since we don't talk about this in international climate negotiations. The UN climate talks have never talked about this. First, I'd like to get a little bit of a sense about the nature of the conversations you had within the commission when you thought about this as a strategy, and then why you came out with this sort of two-part recommendation on a moratorium and on research and governance. Okay. Well, let me just say that um, we were asked to join the commission to look at the various means. One of the, of the potential means was um, geoengineering, solar radiation management. Um, I would say, I know I, and I think every commissioner, approached that issue with the utmost caution. Um, it isn't an issue that we hope to have to explore, but the reality is um, we're in a crisis, and um, the first thing that we concluded was, listen, we don't know enough about this in any way. So that was the moratorium. Mm -hmm. The moratorium is, this is nowhere is near, um, there's not nearly enough information to evaluate whether this could be safe, whether it's viable, what the consequences are, where they would be, how great they would be. A lot more needs to be known, so we're going to propose a moratorium on, uh, on deployment and large-scale uh, uh, field investigations. We also propose that there be a, a very strong governance mechanism on research. And I think you know there are, there are a lot of people, or a number of people, who say there shouldn't be any research. But research is being done. It's being done at this university, other universities. So our view was, how do you regulate that research? How do you control that research? What's the governance mechanism that needs to be in place to oversee research so something inadvertent doesn't happen? The other thing that we, was very clear to us is that the research currently is lodged in a small number of institutions in the global north, and um, it's not available. You know, the, the familiarity with solar radiation um, management research is really not, uh, it's just not familiar or known um, around the world, and there are not researchers around the world. So if you're considering a technology that could have planetary consequences, people across the planet need to understand and be familiar enough to have a judgment on it, and if there's a governance mechanism that engages people worldwide, that everyone has enough knowledge to participate um, knowingly in it. One thing you know, that is clear is uh, there could be very different consequences in very different regions, consequences on rainfall patterns and food security and a whole host of other things. We have no idea what those are. So what we really identified was, yeah, there are people doing this research, you know, potentially people think it could lower the planet's temperature by one degree. But if we don't fully understand what the impacts are in different places across the world and how great those impacts are and what we do about it, 
we cannot move forward. So I would say our recommendations were extremely cautious and, um, and really uh, calling out to uh, those in positions of governance to really begin to understand this enough to, under, to, to do, put in place government mechanisms so the consequences are fully understood and protected against. Yeah, so I think Francis obviously did a very good job in giving you the, you know, the technical reasoning and where we are. Uh, I'm going to try and take a different angle to it because I think it is absolutely reasonable for everyone to be very, very concerned about this unknown technology with unknown consequences. And I would like to share with you that I remember in the first meeting in Bellagio where, uh, you know, SRM technology was first discussed, one of my uh, being a geostrategic sort of you know, policy practitioner, uh, I compared it to like the Afghanistan adventure. And I said that we have gone into so many adventures where, which have had unintended consequences, which for years and decades you have to go through where the problem you go on to solve becomes a smaller problem than the one that you've created in its stead, right? And I know a lot of people view it like that. Now, uh, first of all, two things I, I, I want to clarify. One, exactly what the commission has said about it. And you have clarified that, Francis, but I just for the sake of clarity would want to reconfirm that, um, that there should be a complete absolute moratorium on large scale experimentation, especially one which has transboundary consequences. So no large scale experimentation, so you do not know there are unintended consequences, you don't play with something, you, you don't play with tools which you don't know how they're going to react. However, at the same time, being pragmatist and smart people and letting logic and reasoning define you know, whatever goes into this report, we also say that research must continue in looking at this technology in greater granular detail and also finding out its consequences, right? At the same time, so moratorium, large scale, research to continue, uh, and then also governance dialogue on how, you know, because this is exceptionally problematic. There, you know, if my country decides to do it, my neighbors don't, well, they're still suffering from the consequences of that. And what could be the consequences? Because you're doing what you're doing, you're bringing the temperature down, but what do you know in 10 years what might happen because of the aerosols or because of even more sort of controversial, perhaps, the ones in the oceans? So we don't know the consequences, but now, why, if, if, if we were living in a moment where overshoot was not a real possibility, we would say, why go to a technology which is so, you know, problematic? However, what is the reason why the commission takes a position that yes, research must continue because you are literally right now on the trajectory where you are absolutely moving towards an overshoot moment, right? Because you were told categorically that you need to halve emissions by 2030 and you have actually only kept at it and perhaps, no, not kept at it, you have only increased it, right? So you also know that on the current course, on the current trajectory that we're going, this is by global temperatures, this is by UNEP. Global temperatures, if we continue to go on this trajectory, by the next century would have grown, which have increased to 2.6 degrees centigrade and currently we're at 1.2 degrees and we are seeing the consequences. So I, I think the, the commission's view on this was that it's not the, you know, it's not ideal, but you have made sure that you are exposing yourself in a position which is non-ideal. And therefore the commission continues, and you know what Francis also mentioned, why on CDR, don't let CDR be an excuse to continue to use fossil fuels, right? So don't give them the option of continuing to blowing and heating and, you know, polluting the planet and then doing some removal so that the fossil fuel will actually become more expensive because the CDR is now attached to it, okay? So don't come up with inefficient solutions. Come up with efficient solutions. Use CDR because what you've already put in the atmosphere is there. The cumulative effect is there. You, even if you stop burning everything today, the cumulative effect is there. So just smart, logical. And I think really one thing I want to say, uh, you know, very proud to be part of the commission and terribly, you know, even if I say so myself, find the report to be a, a piece of logic. And I think what we were able to do, because we were all coming from the, you know, what we call the East and the West and the Global North and the Global South, but I think each one of us had a commitment to logic and reason. And therefore, when you were talking about political will, what would it take? If the commitment were to go to logic and reason, and not which country and which, 
you know, region stands for what? The solution's already on the table, many of them. So I want to get to this challenge of the political logic, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I will and, uh, remind everyone we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, we have four mics set up. Uh, so in a few minutes, I'll be going to you. So if you have a question, you're welcome to go ahead and queue up at a mic. Uh, so if we say we're going to uh, implement a moratorium and you encourage individual governments to adopt a moratorium, you encourage governments to then work with their partners around the world to more take on a moratorium. Um, what is it that, suppose you are on a commission in the future, and there had been some work on research and governance, what's the evidence that you would like to see where you'd say, I think we should recommend that this should be used in context X, whatever that might be? Or is it hard to sort of envision that hypothetical? I'm kind of curious, I, I say that because Francis, I'm not sure you, you buy the hypothetical, but I'm curious why, you know, if we say we're not going to do something, what's going to be the basis for saying we might consider it in the future? Well, I would hope we're never at that place. I just want to make that very clear. And that's why, you know, the, the first care cut emissions, that's what we know how to do. It's cost effective. We have to transition to clean energy. And as fast as we do it, you know, we've got to move as quickly as possible. Um, I'm hoping that the moratorium will always be in place and that we won't both reach the point where we have to use it, but we would have to know so much to consider that. And I think what worries me the most is not will the technology lower the temperature, but what the consequences are in different parts of the world what kind of governance mechanism would we have that's fair and equitable that could actually make that judgment? We don't even have the planetary ability to cooperatively agree on cutting emissions. Under what circumstances could we make as serious a decision as that? That's why it's very hard for me to imagine um, under what circumstances we would have adequate governance to actually lift it, but I think that um, we need to do the work to try to figure out if that could ever be developed. Right now, it's in the geopolitical situation that we're facing worldwide, it's very hard to imagine that. But to this hypothetical question, I think I have a very easy answer. And the easy answer is that this will never be a measure of choice. Yeah? It's never going to be something that we right. think that, oh, we must do. Uh, SDR, you know, I don't think it's going to be like that. SRM, sorry. Uh, it's going to be an emergency measure, perhaps. And when will we be in a position that we'd have to do it? When we are unable to do the first C of the care and we are unable to, you know, we have done a pretty shoddy job at cutting emissions. And if we continue to be on this trajectory, it is absolutely then the risk of the planet heating up and what it is creating in terms of havoc, floods, uninhabitable circumstances, that the risk of that is going to be so overwhelming that you will be forced to, in a, as an emergency measure, perhaps go towards SRM. Now, therefore, the need to do more research on how this technology can work and simultaneously work on perhaps governance, because we're already, it's, let's not be delusional. Let's not sleepwalk ourselves into a crisis. We're already in that moment. We are, we are on the trajectory of overshoot. Yes, a lot of Agencies would not like to put their badge on it, but research tells us, science tells us we're already there. Since we're already there, you, there are no good options. The good option was the C. It was cut. Cut right now. Cut as much as is possible. Adaptation is costly. We still, we're already at a place where adaptation is a requirement. It's not an option anymore. It's a requirement because we have, you know, done enough damage that without adaptation we cannot, uh, you know, uh, survive in some ways. And then reduce is also not exactly easy, as Francis has said, or economical, but we're already we're at a place where we'll have to do that removal. Um, and the last one is obviously something, is we, that's why we call it explore. Explore this further so that when, in, you know, when the emergency moment that is on the, in the current trajectory likely to come, when that happens, you should know what will be the consequences. Uh, so, so Hina, you have experience doing diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, climate diplomacy is 
messy. Uh, when we think about like how we bring these ideas mm -hmm. uh, to the fore, sometimes we think through um, how do I find the right forum for this? Is yeah. it part of, I'm gonna do outreach on a bilateral basis? Do I work within, uh, with say, the neighbors in my region? Do I work through a UN forum? Um, there's a sense in which, when I read the recommendations in this report, mm -hmm. you kind of stand back from some of that. Mm -hmm. And I'd like sort of your thoughts on, what do you think would be some of the most effective strategies mm -hmm. if a policymaker leading a government, uh, you know, if a, if a, if a mm -hmm. president or prime minister tasked their foreign minister or their environment minister to go work on this, what do you think might be some of more, the most effective initial steps to start to implement some of these recommendations? Okay, so I think one thing, the jury's not out there, I think we already know the answer to the fact that the world is more fractured today than it was five years back and the world was more fractured five years back than it was 10 years back, right? Uh, and to expect a grand settlement on this, unlikely to happen. So the, the answers, as I said initially also, are all going to be as localized as help yourself as is possible. However, there's certain tools which have to be internationally deployed, okay? And there's certain tools which have been partially regionally deployed well, but have not been accessible to the developing world where they're perhaps needed the most. Now, one very interesting example is the carbon credits. Do farmers in Pakistan or India have access to, or you know, Bangladesh have access to carbon credits where they are, you know, uh, have an incentive to take care of their mangroves? No, absolutely not. I mean, is carbon credit something which is transferable, which is, you know, uh, which which uh, even companies find it absolutely impossible? Is there a common carbon credit market? Is there a common price? No. So we have actually done much worse than we allow ourselves to accept and to think. Then the other is the resource gap, okay? So for instance, I know, and I'm very proud of the fact that Pakistan is a country where there are no climate deniers. You know, we're sitting in a country more developed, more educated than ours. I see a lot of climate deniers. I, I at least hear them out loud quite a bit. In Pakistan, we do not have climate deniers. We literally, like the farmer in Muzaffargarh has experienced floods to know the Shopkeeper in Gilgit, Baltistan has experienced floods to know. We have lived through the climate crisis to know. It's not a figment of our imagination or a scientist's, you know, imaginary. It is real. We have no climate deniers. Now, if you were to give us an option, we would adapt, not only adapt, but we will change completely to really clean energy as of yesterday. Every political party, every political leader has immense commitment to it. Every person has a commitment to it, right? However, what is the gap? The gap is the resource gap, right? So now when we talk about all of the resources that are committed in fancy events, as I said, do they actually trickle down? Do they actually convert through the bank? Very, very difficult, almost impossible. And have we been able to create the ecosystem that those resources can be easily accessible. You know, uh, sorry, I'm taking a little bit more time, but I'm gonna give you an example. When the floods of 2022 hit Pakistan, I went back to the drawing board. You know, we, we opened up the, the foreign office, you know, conference room, and I got all our climate experts from all over the world on, on the screen, and those who were in the head office there, and I said, listen, we need to go and tap into whatever financing is available. Let's look at whatever is available. You know in real terms what is available? Nothing, literally nothing. The Green Climate Fund, I think Pakistan was able to get 100 million, which was long cumulated programs, which were, which took, like, process was more than the content, and everything else gets very complex and complicated, and we keep on making it more and more complicated. So I think we need to get real, we need to get focused on the results, we need to, and, uh, you know, short answer to your, I've given you a very long answer, but short answer is that I don't think there will be a grand settlement on what needs to be done. I think every country needs to pick up the tools, do whatever it can, and then, try and hope that some of the international architecture around it, such as carbon credits, such as resource gap, is filled by um, the countries that matter. Great. Let me go to, uh, I see a question up here on the top. Uh, as a reminder, questions are sentences that end with question marks. Yes, please. <laughs> Great. Uh, th thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm a second year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question wants to go back to climate finance, which you discussed. You mentioned that there is just not money out there. Is it, so in your opinion, is it some kind of realignment of interest, investment interest, or impact and impact uh, interest from the investor side, or is it, you know, is it some kind of financial mechanism that just hasn't been 
uh, used well enough or deployed well enough um, to uh, increase the scalability but also the impact of climate finance. Um, it's a hot topic this year at COP28, so I'd love to hear your take on are we expecting any kind of breakthrough or is it going to be a continuous uh, deadlock at COP this year? Thank you very much. Okay, um, I think, uh, you know, the world, uh, some of the problem with the governance architecture of the world is that the world changed and the architecture remained the same. It did not adapt with the changing realities of the world, right? So if you look at the Bretton Woods institutions, used to do wonderful work maybe 30 years back because they were meant, they were created 45 or seven, you know, 50 years back for that world. Were they able to adapt to the changing realities of the world now? So in my view, the real scale is going to come from the private sector, right? However, what is the big challenge over there? And that is the big challenge. And I think that challenge is something that we have not been able to overcome. The great, the great big challenge over there is whitewashing and greenwashing, right? Whitewashing and greenwashing. And what is whitewashing and greenwashing? Suddenly, there is financing available uh, for anything that's green, OK? Uh, now, what will, what will happen is that, but in the Western world, generally, the processes are more important so that companies who are not really wanting to do or geared towards doing that, but will greenwash their projects and be able to get the finances and then sort of use it in interesting ways rather than countries and places which actually need the finances to be able to actually do what needs to be done. So I think we have to be really, really mindful of not falling into the trap that we did fall in on development. We still have time. We need to really make, when we say transparency, it really must be transparency on the ground as to, rather than just on the books. Uh, so, and, and really the leader or the leading uh, lead on scalability will come from the private sector. Uh, I, I have no um, sort of, I, I have no uh, doubts about that, yeah. Here, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a Weatherhead scholar here working on climate and security. You mentioned, it's a question for the two of you, you mentioned the whole idea of uh, any very incomplete global governance. And so the Overshoot Commission is working on how to prevent or how to find solutions. The other side is, we're going to reach 1.5, 2 point something. We're going to have societal collapse is a great possibility. What do you see in terms of that global architecture to be able to address those issues? Because they're going to happen. Uh, the, Security Council Commission, uh, the Security Council is not necessarily working. So what have you discussed in this commission in terms of addressing the practical consequences of what's coming in, in terms of conflict and security issues as well? Well, we discussed it in our conversations. It doesn't, um, I don't think we developed conclusions around it, but we did in the report, there's a whole section on what are the impacts of the climate that we're experiencing and certainly uh, migration and uh, moving populations, um, destruction from floods, uh, wildfires, et cetera, and particularly from extreme heat um, were identified as very serious issues that are only accelerating, and more and more people are being affected by them. And they have to be taken seriously. At the same time, um, you know, we had a lot of, and particularly around, for example, um, the moratorium on SRM, we discussed, should there be a global treaty? But, you know, we've all had experience with how long it takes to get a global treaty, and the fact is we don't have that much time. So we really concluded that we have to look for willing par parties here. People have to take, the people who are willing, the countries that are willing, need to step out, be willing, show their examples, band together. That right now, um, that seems more promising to us than some new global agreement that's gonna be developed just because that's not the state of the world that we're in currently. You know, I don't know if you had. Yeah, just simply, I, and I also think uh, that there is, you know, this commission was uh, people who decided to give their time, who all felt very strongly about the fact that everything existed out there, but just needed to be put it together. So I, I don't think we were pretending to be more than what we were, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. coming up with a grand governance structure wasn't really our mandate, <laughs> self-given mandate, but it wasn't really something that we thought we had. And who would be listening? Right. <laughs> I mean, if we came up with this grand 
governance structure, you think everybody, so uh, yeah, we didn't waste too much time on that. We just said it's quite difficult yeah, and went, difficult. And took I, that. I think also, if you, yeah. you know, if you read the report, you'll find in several sections, it says, you know, we don't have the answers here. We're identifying the questions mm -hmm. that need to be answered. But basically, people in positions of responsibility, yeah. government leaders, corporate leaders, people who are um, currently in charge need to explore these things and come up with answers. You know, I, 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 we were high level in a limited period of time grappling with a very, very serious issue. You know, what are the mechanisms for action? Clearly mitigation was number one. These others have to be explored and they have to be explored by people who are in positions of actually taking action. The commission was a voluntary endeavor. We don't have that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Let's go up here, please. Hi, my name is Natalie, and I'm an MPP1 here at the Kennedy School. Um, thank you for speaking with us today. My question is, um, we've hinted a lot about, uh, we've hinted at a lot today that there has been knowledge of the climate crisis for a long time and solutions about what we can and should do. Um, we've had lots of promises from global leaders. We've had lots of reports that have outlined the steps that we should take, and not a lot of change has actually been made. What about this moment gives you hope that we can actually make tangible steps towards progress? Can I, yeah, I will simply say what gives me hope is the fact that it's in your face. Yeah. You can't hide anymore. That's right. It's literally in your face. I mean, the, what happened in Pakistan was a warning bell. What's happening in Libya is showing you what happened in Hong Kong, developed country, you know, because a lot of people used to say, oh, was Pakistan not resilient enough? What did you do nothing when you had the floods of 2010? And our answer is, how do you prepare for something which is not supposed to happen? Because, you know, I, I'd like to share with you, the floods of 2022 in Pakistan were truly unique in the fact that at the same time, the catchment areas where it is supposed to rain, where you can be resilient, where you were resilient, there were drought conditions. Whereas areas where it's not supposed to rain at all, had monumental rainfall. Okay, so you can't ever be resilient against something which is completely unpredictable, and that's why it makes it a climate event rather than a riverine flood event, right? So why there is probably hope is because none of us, you know, we can be delusional as much as we want, but it's in your face. And therefore, we, since we see it, now even if we still don't do anything about it, then we can, you know, all rest in peace and agree that, yes, the climate will become uninhabitable, and we're cool with it. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, having worked on this for many decades, I always sort of say there's always hope and despair. But I think to Hina's point, now despair it creates hope because the conditions are so present. It's not perhaps, you know, this is going to happen in the future, but millions of people around the world are being affected every day. And that creates hope that action will actually occur as a result of that. And I think. As we get more desperate, the calls for action will get louder. And I'm hoping that people in positions of responsibility feel that it is their responsibility to take the action that's required. We know what has to be done, and we know we can do it. We're just not doing it quickly enough. The green energy transition is happening, mm. but it isn't happening at the scale and pace that's required. So it's all about acceleration. And acceleration comes from um, people demanding action and holding people accountable. Over here, please. Uh, hi, I'm an MPP1 student at the Kennedy School. So uh, Minister Carr, uh, Hina, you mentioned the importance of logic and reason. Um, unfortunately, we have seen the politicizing of uh, climate issues um, around the globe. Um, so when countries work together on the global scale, um, leaders are sometimes constrained by public opinions in their own country. So how can um, leaders from different countries who, you know, which have different op public opinions uh, navigate through um, sort of the politicizing of the issue and use logic and reason to work together, even though there are so much noises to tell them not to do that. Um, just very quick, like in Canada, we have seen sort of drastic increase of wildfire. And even after that, there are a lot of people in Canada still denying um, the climate crisis. They're just not really believing in it. So it posed a huge problem for the leaders to overcome that 
Um, so I, I'm interested in your opinion in, in that issue. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, you know, really, I, I think a lot of the answers are, uh, it, it's very simplistic view, but, you know, this is my reach conclusions after 20 years of diplomacy and working also in the development, you know, economic side of it, uh, is that if we think that we can fool all people for all time, we really think we can get away with murder. Right, so whitewashing and greenwashing to me is the biggest challenge. And I'll give you an example. Even when you mention the public, uh, you know, the, the challenge of public opinion, uh, you know, Canada, while it tells every developing country to stop uh, using fossil fuels as much as possible, makes it also part of its developmental agenda, continues to drill at a speed of lightning, right? Uh, the same thing would have to be true for Norway. Uh, so if we, and the same thing is true also of the United Kingdom and many other countries and fracking in the United States. Now, if we were able, whether, whether it's geostrategic or geoeconomics or development or climate, the answer is one, stop believing in exceptionalism. Okay, so it's okay for me because it serves my public interest because it gives me resources and money and because that's a, and it's not okay for you. So I think if, if, if all countries somehow um, just start being honest about it and start taking the responsibility and start realizing right now we think that we can, you know, at, not at my cost is the general. And we think, so I, I truly believe we have not, we are still sleepwalking into the crisis because we have not still realized the enormity of what we're sleepwalking into. We think this will do, this will not do, and this is not doing. So taking out, uh, and, and uh, I just want to end by saying that I do not think it's a matter of public opinion as much as leaders using public opinion for their own interest. Uh, so I, I think the public can be, and uh, at the end of the day, leadership requires you to do what is right for the public rather than pursue public opinion to do what is right for your politics. Yeah, so it's as simple as that. I'm Rajesh, I'm an MCMPA candidate from India. And I just wanted to ask about, uh, there is a lot of flooding in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. So how to address the challenge of uh, uh, climate change, uh, migration, food security, and possible conflicts between communities? That would be a day and a half, no? Yeah, yeah <laughs> that work. But, but I will just, I mean, you really, it will be a day and a half if one starts talking about everything. But really, when you talk about Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, the only thing I want to say is the great example of saying that there are no national boundaries or borders on climate change. If the ice caps are melting, the Himalayas, the Karakurams, we share, right? And climate change is something where it would not care what your caste, creed, color, nationality, or level of uh, income even is, right? We saw refugees be made out of really large landed people, such as the same thing happens when earthquakes come, right? Everybody's the same. Mother Nature does not, is actually very egalitarian when it comes uh, to floods and earthquakes, yeah. Let's go up here, please. Hi, I'm Brian, I'm a first year MPID student. Um, so earlier in your um, uh, earlier in the presentation, you alluded to the importance of incentives to maintain biological carbon sinks in developing countries. Um, so my question is, what are the reforms you think would be necessary in carbon markets, both compliance and offset markets, to ensure that there are proper incentives for these carbon sinks? Okay, f first of all, carbon pricing. There is no standard international carbon pricing. It's regional pricing, right? And then the standardization of access. So I know that as a very large corporation, I even have to either have to, uh, you know, ask the World Bank to make a project out of it, and then I will be able to access it. You cannot. So coming from the developing world, you actually will find it virtually impossible to be able to access it. What we actually need is for this to be accessed by every small farmer, every small entrepreneur, for this to be for everyone. So then the incentive to that is, is actually you creating an economy which is a win-win because you're saving, the, you know, you're, you're contributing to, towards climate change in a positive way and you're also making, you know, doing, doing, making money for yourself in some ways. So uh, carbon markets right now do not function at an international. So it's not like the price of, you know, we don't have to figure out a dollar here and a dollar anywhere else is the same. So it has not been internationalized as much. 
as it should have. Hi, I'm Swati from India. And uh, my question was exactly what you just brought up like in the last statement on, is there a way that you could think that the international carbon credit markets, the benefit can actually reach that smallest farmer and that small business owner who's actually dealing with the climate crisis already and cannot wait for the next COP session to have more conversations. Um, any, any thoughts on actually not making it a very, very long-term conversation, but using this as an incentive to trickle down? Um, well, I think that um, there are a couple of things with carbon markets, and there's, I mean, I'm sure people who are working on that here are very aware that there's a lot of different systems. They don't have integrity. There's a million questions about them. But there is a lot of work being done on how do we create the metrics, accountability, and transparency to know that they really work and are real. And the report really emphasizes, and this is Tahina's point, that this has to work on the ground. It has to get to the local farmer. It has to get to those people who are storing carbon in the soil and protecting their mangroves. and. Um, protecting their forests, that we don't have the mechanisms for that now. I mean, there is a lot of, to Hina's point, greenwashing in the system. There are lots of claims. There's a report that came out today from Corporate Accountability that basically said, I think 90% of the carbon offsets that they examined were fake. Well, it's only going to work if we can have the kind of transparency and accountability to make sure that they're not fake. But on the other hand, there's real value in how on the ground protection is going on, and if we aren't able to figure out a mechanism to pay people who are doing it, um, we're not going to be able to secure that carbon. So we really, this is a problem that we have to be able to solve. We're not there yet, but we know what the problems are in the current system, and we have to solve for that. Let me take one final question here before we wrap up, please. Thank you. Uh, hi. So my name is Saira. I'm from Pakistan. And um, so I'm also studying education policy and, and at Hugsy. So what I'd like to know is that, you know, like you said, the answer is right there on the table. We have the research, we have the expertise, we have the tools, we have the money. How do you get all stakeholders to agree that, yes, this is a solution, we need to consider it as a priority, and we need to sit down and do something about it? Mm -hmm. Like, how do, how do you think that would go? Because policy intervention would depend a lot on how stakeholders take it. The correct answer, I mean, the honest answer is it would not go. It would not happen. So I think we're waiting for a grand, you know, consensus to emerge. Uh, I mean, try and find consensus on the shape of this table, and all of us will have our views on it, right? So majoritarianism, as Francis said, would have to prevail. And in some ways, majoritarianism is that you should not be allowed to stop me from doing something which is good for me. Right, and I should pursue. So uh, I, I truly believe that the solutions could be very regional, more than global. Uh, unfortunately, the region that you and I come from is obviously going the opposite route, right? Uh, so that's what it is. But yeah, there's certain things. Look, there's certain things that we already know, which are which we in which we have done enough to be able to carbon credits. I believe is one of them. Uh, to we really need to make sure or somehow be able to agree on the governance structure. Now, that I can't do alone. That sitting in Pakistan we can't do, sitting anywhere else we can't do. We have to have a common language on that. But there are lots of other things in which you can just start doing what you do. Now, I genuinely believe, having lo looked through the, uh, you know, the, um, the national goals of Pakistan, the na nationally determined goals of Pakistan, we are overly committed on clean energy. Okay, now we need the resource gap to be filled. Now, how do we fill that resource gap? I think it's going to be through the private sector, but how does that private sector get the confidence to be able to come to countries like ours? So they're, they're, we, we're at the cusp of where multiple solutions exist, but I think I really want to, because we're wrapping up, I really want to come back to the whole ethos of what this report is really telling you. Okay, and I think it's very important. And one thing that this report is telling you is that you cannot move around or Try, underestimate or think that you can do without cutting emissions. That that is and will remain and must remain the priority goal. And it is also telling you that we have not kept our commitments. And it is also telling you that on the trajectory that we currently are going, 
we are probably going to be in an uninhabitable space where we will have to look at deploying technology that we don't even want to look at. So it is absolutely telling you that the moment has passed when you could do it without any cost. Now you can only do it with cost. Uh, it is also telling you that all the solutions are already there, right? But waiting for the grand consensus is perhaps not going to happen. So whatever you can take, um, you know, let's, tr let's start doing. And it is also telling you that the governance structure around climate change hasn't worked very well, right? And that you need to rethink. Now, we are not the ones who can do that rethinking. Uh, I uh, was, you know, we, we were talking amongst ourselves and we were saying that if I was a high level policy anywhere in the developed world, I would really want to read this report. Because it's really, it's, it's, it's just a coherent bringing together of everything which was already there. We've not done anything novel or rocket scientist-y about it. It's just everything that already, but it's a coherent piece on what is already out there and what already needs to be done. Now, some of you may end up in your career actually being a leader in a government. You may, earlier in your career, be staffing someone who's a leader in the government. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at this report. I think it is an incredibly rich and thoughtful exploration of all the strategies we might be able to explore and implement to try to reduce the risk of a changing climate. And in that sense, I think it's a real credit to this commission of sort of broadening, I think, the policy debate and opening up ideas, perhaps for some of us in the room, for some who are joining us online, to think through creatively, how do we go about implementing it? How do we think about the mechanics of the policy? How do we think about the logic of it, whether it's of the policy or the politics? Sometimes the logic of politics is thornier than the logic of policy. Um, but I appreciate you all joining us here tonight for this conversation. And I'd like you to join me in thanking Francis Beinecke and Rabani Carr for their insights and for their service on the Climate Overshoot Commission. Thank you very much. Yeah.